what's up y'all this is Zach with Living Corporate and you know how you got 12 days of Christmas right we're doing this thing 12 days of podcast so that's 12 days of podcast leading up to Christmas day and a little bit after because it's 12 days really excited about this want to make sure that y'all hear some of the great content that we have in our vault uh, from earlier this year uh, that we didn't release because of timing or scheduling and coordination but we're still really excited about it so the next thing you're going to hear is a conversation that we had earlier this year really hope that you check it out and you enjoy it and before we get there we're going to tap in with tristan What's going on, y'all? It's Tristan of Layfield Resume Consulting, and I've teamed up with Living Corporate to bring you all a weekly career tip. Today, we're going to discuss making the most of where you are. Are you eyeing that executive level role and don't understand why you aren't there already? Are you consistently overlooked for promotions? Are you wrapped up in your side hustle and feel your day job is getting in the way? So let's be real here. If you said yes to any of those questions, odds are you may either hate your role or you may be slacking a bit and don't even know it. You probably dread going in and are wondering, why am I here? Believe me, I get it. I've been in that same exact spot. Nonetheless, you are in that job and you need to make the most of it while you're there. Sometimes it's hard to see where the opportunities are, so I'm going to try to make it plain for you. Is your 9 to 5 boring? If so, listen to educational and business podcasts and audiobooks that may help you get to that, that next level. Do you need new skills? Utilize the company's learning management system to take courses and learn skills that would be valuable in your current role or for the roles you're seeking. Are you planning on starting your own business? Study your 9 to 5's business concepts, strategies, and tools. It's like free business school. You get to learn from their mistakes. Want to know what the, another department does? Sit in on meetings if you're allowed to or request some informational interviews of your own. You'd be surprised who will actually say yes. Do you need a certification or another degree to take your career to the next level but you're strapped for cash? Utilize any tuition reimbursement programs or certification programs that the company has as a stepping stone. No matter how horrible we think a job is, we have to stop and realize how we can leverage our current roles to get to our future ones. We have to get out of the habit of asking for more when we haven't mastered less. The resources your current job provides can assist you in getting to that next level. If you treat every day in the office like it's practice, I can guarantee you'll set yourself up for whatever your next move is. This tip was brought to you by Tristan of Layfield Resume Consulting. Check us out on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Layfield Resume or connect with me, Tristan Layfield, on LinkedIn. All right, so our guest today is Tara Robertson. Uh, Tara Robertson is an intersectional feminist who uses data and research to advocate for equality and inclusion. She's currently on sabbatical. She has t more than 10 years experience making open source and tech communities more diverse and welcoming, including three years leading diversity and inclusion at Mozilla. Mozilla Firefox, y'all. So like, y'all know that logo for those, you know, because some of y'all, we don't know the names and stuff, but it's the logo. It's like a fire. It's like a fox, but it has like, it's on fire. It's a search engine. It's a bunch of different stuff. But anyway, her core values are social justice, collaboration and all things open, open source, open access and open education. Tara finds people fascinating and her curiosity and delight in connecting people come together in person and online as a librarian with five years leading accessibility work in higher education. We got to talk about your librarian background, by the way. She brings practical expertise of how universal design can be used to, to include people with disabilities and enhance access for everyone. Tara has a master's of library and information studies from the University of British Columbia. Tara, how are you? It's funny when we started this call, I was like, how are you, Zach? And in 2020, that feels like such a loaded question. <laughs> um, I am delighted to be talking to you this Friday. I'm really excited. Um, and, you know, we like we found each other like randomly, like you you followed me and I was like, oh, what's going on? And I hate you. I was like, why'd you follow me? You're like, you probably said something I liked. I was like, oh, OK. You know, it was like very just like an organic situation. It wasn't like a you know, like a, a purposed or intentional networking thing, which is cool. I like that too. Um, so, so look, let's talk a little bit about your perspective on diversity and inclusion as a space today, right? Like I think I, just, I, I continue to ask folks who come on Living Corporate this because I do, I do find it intriguing. I feel as if we're like at a, um, an inflection point uh, when it comes to what has been historically acceptable and kind of passed on at, for, for diversity, equity, inclusion, DNI, DNB, inclusion, diversity, whatever acronym you want to use, and what black employees specifically are demanding, right? It seems as if we're at, you know, when you look across, like you see all these major brands 
folks stepping down, uh, folks getting fired. I mean, I'm just curious, like if you were to like look at this landscape, like what would you call out or how would you describe it? I was just nodding to everything you were saying. Um, it's interesting because I it, the seasons are changing here in Vancouver. The leaves are starting to to change color and fall off the trees. I uh, quit my job a couple of weeks ago, and it's the first time in 25 years that I haven't been working. So it feels like a, a real transition point in my life, but also kind of in the world. Um, so I feel really privileged to just have a moment to take a break and step back and reflect on my career and my life, but also to kind of look at the industry and look at society, <laughs> look at just all sorts of things. Like what I've been thinking this week is that the DNI space or DEB or DIBS, like there, there's so many different acronyms. I'm just, I'm amazed at how many jobs there are right now. Um, I've been having some conversations with companies where they're creating their first um, DEI role a company that had 180 people, a company that had 8,000 people, and a company that had 18,000 people. And it's interesting for me to kind of interview um, different companies on why they're creating these roles right now. Like to be an 18,000 person company and to not have um, seen a business need in the past, but right now to, to, to say, you know, this is, a, this is a priority. Like it's a really interesting time. And just thinking about 2020, like it's been... In some ways, it's been a total dumpster fire, but there's also been, there's been some amazing transformations. Like, I never thought we'd be having the conversations we're having about racism in the workplace that we're, we've been having this year. Like, could you have imagined this? No, no, not really. I mean, because like we're using language that just a year ago, I was told that I cannot use like within my work context, right? But we're using that language now. We're using terms like white supremacy, anti-racism. And that's, that's, that's good. Like, I'm, I'm happy about that. I'm happy about that. It does feel like a certain level of like collective gaslighting by white folks mm -hmm. in terms of this, that like, you know, we're, y'all are just now discovering that racism is like a problem, but you know, you take what you can get and you know, if, if this is going to be a season where we're actually heard, then, you know, I want to maximize that opportunity to be heard. Right. I think what's really interesting is that I, I'm still waiting for this, which is you know, transitioning past talking about racism in the abstract and really getting into talking about how the systems and structures within that respective company are racist and uphold white supremacy. And then doing the work of dismantling those policies, procedures, systems, whatever, to really create true organizational justice within that space. Like, that's what I'm really still I've yet to really see that, like, at scale. I've yet mm -hmm. to, I've, and I've yet to hear the, the discussion, quote unquote, evolve to that position. You know what I mean? Yeah, like I, I, mean, I think it was Michelle Kim who might have said. I can't remember who said it, but they're like you know, in the in the last couple of months, the conversation has changed. But like, they're like, you know, the 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 phrase is white supremacy, and I'm a racist are just flowing a little too easily off of some people's tongues without a level of like criticality or like without a level of responsibility maybe like so I, yeah I do I do hear and feel that as well um, I've definitely seen both like looking at other companies and where I was working like some of the ideas that um, people had initially like they wanted white people and non-black people felt this this need to do something and sometimes the things that people wanted to do like when you would ask like how does this um, in practical terms, like lift up black software developers, or how does this create uh, more space and equity for black staff? Like there was a long pause and like sort of the dot, dot, dot. Well, um, it's like, okay, like think about that. And like, is that what we need to be doing? Like, hmm. Like, and also like a, a lack of like when, or just maybe it's navigating a new space, but also some like a lack of maturity around when us non-Black people can show up as allies and do structural work and when it's necessary to either loop back with Black communities or stand behind Black folks and let them speak. Like some of the things like it's, it's a no-brainer. Like I don't need to take up Black people's time asking some of these questions. Like some simple Google searches and critical thinking, like I can get there on my own. Like people have other things going on like so it's like there's a lack of or it's new to kind of figure out like where 
white people and where like people like me who are non-black people of color should be acting in this space. And I, I hope we don't get stuck in that awkward space where people are like, oh, I don't know what to do. Like, ah, uh, like it's uncomfortable. So I'm just going to like not address things. So like that we're in a space where we're saying the right things or we're saying these words like white supremacy and dismantle anti-racism. But like in actual fact, nothing's really changed. Like, right. I think that's the gaslighting you're talking about. It is a lack of critical thought. And I think for me, like what I've been trying to work on and I'm talking to my a mentor of mine and my father about this, which is just not demonizing people for their own incompetence. Like incompetence isn't malicious, right? Like some people are just genuinely incompetent in a space or ignorant. And that's that's not OK. And it is creating harm. So like I'm not it, your incompetence can still create harm. I think we, we're seeing that we're, we're seeing that politically pointedly. We're seeing that. But also at the same time, like, you know, that's for me, I've been trying to grow in that way. So what I and I bring that up because I just think, you know, you, you talked about lack of critical thought and it's just like it's frustrating. The same people that can, you know, build build like cars or rockets or whatever the case is or can solve for like very complex um, quantitative uh, challenges like or mathematical challenges or scientific challenges for some reason you know, their competence or their critical thinking goes out the window in these spaces. And so I get, I I struggle Tara because I think about, okay, like, like how much of this is you being incompetent and how much is you being purposely obtuse? Right. And that's where I get frustrated. I think to your point though, around like, you know, where non black and Brown folks show up in these spaces and how they engage, you know, for me, I think about the fact that if folks would just show up and like give up their capital, and give up their space to like amplify the black and brown person next to them. I don't think you're going to miss with that. Right. Like that <laughs> the, the you're not like, true. but I think, I think the true. issue, I think the issue is, is that the issue is that we don't want to give up power. We don't want to give up control. When I say we, I, I actually don't mean me. I mean, white people. Um, so like white, well-meaning people, there's racism in that too. And that, that it's like, well, no, I want to, I want to come, I want to Columbus this. Like, I, well, I want you to have, you know, space to talk, but I, but I need to control how you talk. I need to control what your space looks like. I need to control and I need the credit for it too. Right. As opposed and to, I'm going to tone police you as you do it. And I'm going to tone police you as you do it. Critique in a nicer way, please. Like you're being really aggressive. <laughs> 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 Right. Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. And I think that's that's my take. Right. Is that like I think it takes a special kind of person to be like, no, I'm going to give you this full stop. I'm going to back up and seed my space, my power, my voice to you. I'm going to hand it to you with no conditions, with no presuppositions. I'm just going to give it to you like that's where we're at. Right. Like we're not in. A, I don't need your. And, I, you know, I was on um, Lori uh, Ruderman. I was on her podcast, Punk Rock HR. She's like, you know, what's the one thing you want folks to get away from, you know, get away from, from this conversation? And I said, look, I said, the one thing I want the white people to get away, listen to this conversation is, I said, we don't want your advice. We want your things, right? And like, I'm still there. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm just thinking when I was at Mozilla, we brought Robin D'Angelo in to come and do a talk on white fragility. Um, I see she was a guest on your podcast before. Yeah. And pretty much, it was a couple of weeks after, like, nationwide protests were happening in the U.S. And as the friend says, like, when the revolution started again. And the talk was important. Um, I think everyone who was awake during that time in the time zones was there. Like, it was, like, 70% of the company was there live. But I knew that there was, like, there wasn't anything in that talk for Black people. Not much in there for Brown people either. Right. But a lot of this information would be new for white people. And we didn't want it to be a one and done. So she's got a great um, reading guide for her White Fragility book. Mm-hmm. And we stood up different reading discussion groups. It was almost all white people. There were some Asian people who participated. But I, we were trying to design, like, how can white people go deeper on this content and start to learn together and unlearn together without putting a tax on Black and Brown people? And actually, I reached out to another Asian woman to see if she would lead one of these groups. And she's like, no, like, I can't, for my own well-being, facilitate this conversation with white people. And she was a little pissed off at me. She's like, how would you, why would you ask me? And I was like, I thought maybe, but yeah, I totally see why not. And thinking for myself, I was like, no, I don't want to facilitate those conversations either. Like, it's harmful to me. But I thought that was a good way to, like, structure deeper learning for white people. 
Because we we need white people to understand and unpack and learn and be different and yeah. like de-invest from white supremacy. And that's going to be some hard work. Um, and I want them to do their work. And I'm willing to create spaces for that work and to be there some of the time. But I can't be there all of the time. It really taxes my my heart and my my head and my like spirit too much. No, 100%. And yeah, I, I think I'm having these conversations like all over, like in a variety of different contexts around like, look, there's different types of work that need to happen right now. Right. And I think that's but the issue. And a shout out to uh, one of my mentors and a dear friend, Liz Swigert. Um, so Liz, at the beginning of our friendship, she would constantly talk about binary thinking. Right. And like not being binary in your thinking. So a lot of there are positions right now. It's like if you're talking about that's wrong, if you're talking about that, it's wrong. And it's like, well, no, there's space for multiple different types of conversations. The issue is, is that we're creating space for the folks that are being harmed. Right. So, like, I agree that, like, bringing in a Dr. Robin D'Angelo to spoon feed the concepts of white supremacy and how it manifests in a sociological way is important. Like, that's really important. You know, I, I know there's been like a lot of articles out there challenging if Dr. D'Angelo should even exist, right, as, a, as an academic, not like literally, but if, if her work mm-hmm. should be, you know, and I, I, think, I think she should. I think, it, I think there's absolutely space for it, right? I, I, I consider like that work like tummy time for anti-racism work. It's what you do before you crawl, before mm-hmm. you walk, right? It can be, if leveraged effectively, very foundational. To your understanding, I think I think what I what I see under indexed, though, is just investment in black wellness um, and like really giving black and brown folks the resources that they need and critical organizational assessment on the impact of the systems within their own companies that create harm. Right. You know, you think about sales departments and like how strictly policies are followed, which then tie into bonuses, which tie into promotions and all these different things, right? Like performance management process, recruitment processes, um, disciplinary chat, like, you know, the, uh, the equitable nature of those things, even how they, how they analyze their data. Like, are you being intersectional in your data analysis? Like there's just a bunch of different questions and like work that I don't think happens for black people. I think, I think we like, there's a lot of work that happens for white folks. And then there's a lot of like tasks that black people, and brown people receive to essentially solve for racism on their own. So, hey, here, do this employee resource group for free. Hey, um, here's a happy hour y'all can coordinate. Hey, here's whatever, right? But it's not, it's here, not. Here's systems. some coaching on executive presence. <laughs> right, yeah, thank you. It's, here's some presentation on how to do Excel well. It's like, no, I don't need that. I don't need that. Like, I need y'all to stop harming me, Right. So let's talk about this. I want to get into your work as a librarian, but before that, I want to talk about Mazula. So like, and I recognize you're on sabbatical. Yeah. I'd love to talk about the work that you are involved in, because I'm not going to speak in the past and sabbatical doesn't mean that you're gone. It means you're taking a break. You know, talk to me about, you know, the work that you're doing, what you're excited about and, you know, wh- what you foresee. Yeah. Before that, I just wanted to, to share two more things about two other speakers that came after at Mozilla. Like, um, yeah. When we brought Dr. Robin D'Angelo, like I said, what my target audience for that that talk was white people at the company. And like to think about bringing in different speakers, like I also wanted to make sure that there was stuff for black people and people of color. So two weeks after we brought in Dr. Sophia Noble, who I actually know from the library world, she's the author of Algorithms of Oppression. And she put together a really phenomenal keynote for our virtual all hands event. Normally, we'd come together in person, but because of COVID, we came together online. And she connected some of her research and had some provocations for us as a a product company. Like, how do we think about technology that centers Black people? Like, Mm -hmm. So she was phenomenal. And it just got us thinking about these issues of anti-racism and other kind of possibilities in the product space. And then it was awesome to partner with um, the lead designers um, around looking at you know, we, we've done a lot of work on debiasing our hiring process, but like when we're doing user research or um, user testing, like what kind of biases exist in those processes? And one of the, the designers um, recommended bringing in Dr. Dory Tunstall. She's the Dean of Design at OCAD University in Toronto. She's the only Black Dean of Design and the only Black female Dean of Design, not just in Canada, but anywhere. Yeah. 
And she did this amazing talk that was so juicy, um, breaking down um, decolonization, breaking down anti-Blackness, breaking down white supremacy, and then talking about some of the changes that she's made at OCAD University, both in terms of centering indigenous, indigenous and Black faculty through different cluster hire programs, the community work that she's been doing, kind of going out and being the face of the institution in different communities that didn't know OCADU. And I just remember she was talking about this, this Black cluster hire and thinking about how to craft a job description that welcomed different people into the institution. And she said that the job description that they wrote, which included like some non-traditional language around and so, you know, like industrial design or interaction design, she's like, are you interested in hip hop aesthetics and design? Mm. And she said the job posting went viral. And some people shared with her that the job posting made them cry because they never seen themselves rep- like um, reflected in the institution and just kind of start to finish as a designer and as a strategic leader. Um they redesigned that process and came up with some really different outcomes. And it was just so inspiring and just really fired me up. And one of the things that she talked about was that success in this system doesn't look like hiring five other people who look like her. She's like, let's be real. I'm a super token. Like I've got the degree from Stanford. I've over excelled in all of these bias systems. She's like, what success would look like is if we could hire a mediocre Indigenous person or a Black person who was simply average. And for me, like, that just pressed a button and, like, gave me some emotions and just made me think about, like, the systems that I've been through and how I felt like, you know, the bar is higher and we have to do better and more in a faster (laughs) way to be... Yeah. And like, I remember being a little kid and saying to my mom, like, that's not fair. And my mom's like, that's how it is. Like, right. suck it up. <laughs> um, this is how it's going to be. Like, if you want it, you are going to have to be better, faster, smarter, like more point. Like, she's like, that's just the way it is. No, a hundred percent. And I think, you know, it's funny. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to drop the names, but I was, um, I was just literally chat. I was on a, like a, a conference. Oh, drop the names, drop the names. <laughs> no, okay, okay. Sure. So I was on clubhouse. Which is a, it's like this new app and it's, um, it's essentially like just a series of like conference calls, like for, for lack of better words, just for the sake of this conversation. And it mm-hmm. was, um, Van Lathan, formerly of TMZ, um, now of the ringer. It was, uh, the executive producer for all American. And it was like some other like folks just in media. And so anyway, we were talking about the concept of black mediocrity and just how black people and brown people don't have the privilege of being average. Right. So like what you just said, like tri- like triggered the reminder that like the black average, black average is oftentimes like white excellence. Right. Yeah. Right. Like you have to be excellent <laughs> in these spaces to be just considered average just for them to leave you alone you have to be excellent and you know i'm fighting for part of me is fighting for black mediocrity like the privilege of just coming in being okay and going home like there's something to be said about that there's something to be said about having the ability just to be right like you know and and the thing about it is like the average person that you meet at your job or whatever you're doing isn't brilliant right if everyone was brilliant like this is not like a slug to everybody it's not some elitist thing it's like if most people were brilliant tara then the world would not look how it looks like most people are not brilliant the average person at your job is just average and that's okay you're talking about like a c c plus maybe a b minus player and that's okay but i don't i can say in my career like i don't meet a lot of c c plus b minus black and brown people like they're typically, no. especially if they're no. women. Right? No. <laughs> like, do you, like I was talking, somebody was like, somebody was like literally tried to challenge me about racism not existing because I'm a manager at a big four consulting firm. I said, do you understand what I had to do to get this manager promotion? And I didn't get it here. I got it somewhere else and took it with me here. Right. Like wow. the hoops and performance, the things that we have to deliver are so high. They're just so different. 
um, and uniquely set apart um, within these spaces. And, I, you know, it's exhausting and it creates all these different stressors, which then, you know, um, invites a bunch of a host of health issues. Right. And so, you know, I, I don't know. You said that it just that that hit me very particularly. So thank you for that. Or maybe people aren't like people bring different flashes of brilliance. Like people, not everyone's going to their their gifts and talents aren't going to look exactly the same. But I sometimes feel like in the workplace, what we're assessing and what we value is so narrow that if your talents aren't in that space, like you really, really have to over deliver. And yeah, black the black women I've worked with are like, they're all exceptional, like exceptional. exceptional. Um, and yeah, like I'm just thinking about like also what my mom said and she meant it in my mom is very pragmatic and she's like, this is just how it is. And like, it's a survival piece and thinking about the the mantra representation matters. Like it would be great to be able to see people of color who are just average because I think also like the representations of people of color and women of color that I see, especially in the tech space, like they're all exceptional. And there's a certain level of imposter syndrome that comes with that as well. It's like, if I want to exist here or be here, like, I'm going to need to be like almost a superhero and right. gosh, I'm just a mortal. Like, right. wow. <laughs> yeah. I want yeah. us to be able to be in like the C-suite, but I also want us just to, like you said, just to be able to be and like have days where we're mediocre or have days where we're just, where we are average. Like that's a, a level of privilege that I've never been able to imagine. I'm, I'm curious, you know, we, we've had, we haven't really had a lot of conversations about data like on living corporate, like we, you know, and how it intersects with, with uh, DEI. I'm curious about your background, um, how it informs the work that you do with Maz- at Mozilla. And then just like, if you have any perspective on where you think data still needs to go as it pertains to um, driving for workplace equity. I love data. <laughs> I love, I love this topic. Um, like I think DEI is sometimes seen as a fluffy thing and the soft skills and the sense of belonging and how we feel included or not in situations, that's really important. Um, I think it's important that we are able to measure that as well, like through employee engagement surveys and whatnot. Um, I think diversity data is really fascinating. Um, when I first got to Mozilla, there was a commitment um, to DNI, but there wasn't any infrastructure in place. So it was a lot of work just to understand like who works here right now. and like, what are the demographics of those people? Um, so working with our HR ops team and someone in IT, we designed and built out a, a dashboard to, to, so we could see who was there, understand what our baseline was, set some measurable goals, um, which I think is really important in any business. Um, we measure things that we care about. And when we set goals, we need to know how we're tracking. So using those tools and making some recommendations about goals, um, worked with senior executives to coach them and help inter- interpret the data and think of tactics to keep us moving in the right direction and to increase representation of women and underrepresented minorities in the U.S. Um, I think that the data doesn't lie. Like it's When you're trying to change something, you you need to know where you're at, where you want to go, and incrementally, like, where you you are um, for for anything. Like, if you're trying to increase the number of users for something, decrease costs on something, measurements are really important. Right. I mean, I'm I'm curious when you talk about measuring. So, you know, well, I'd like to get your perspective on, like, the state of diversity data today. Like, what would you say are some of the common pitfalls and things that folks can like just low hanging fruit things that folks organizations can do in terms of how they analyze or view their data that could create better outcomes. Well, I think even just understanding the the baseline data for a lot of companies, like that's the first step and it it sounds easy, but um, data is messy, like and cleaning it up and making sure you're on the right page and that you understand everyone's aligned on what definitions you're using. Like that's some work to do. Some of the larger companies, like I saw in Google's external diversity disclosure, they represented their data in an intersectional way, which I think that's not work that I've done, but I think is really important to to do. 
like not just looking at women, but like how many white women, how many black women, right. how many Asian women, how many Latino women? Like I think when you start to to look at the data that way, you really see where you're doing well and you're not, and where you need to focus. There's there's some people kind of DNI professionals who are more data driven and some who are less data driven. I I'm probably one one of the more data driven people. Um, I think it's important to be able to show impact in the work that we do as well. So whether that's trying to increase psychological safety or increase just general safety in a workplace, like these are all emergent problems. Like no country, no company, no industry has them solved. So we're trying new things and we're experimenting. So we need to be able to see, one, if our hypothesis is valid or if the interventions that we're doing are actually effective. So I think measurement is important there. Around like where with data and like kind of diversity and inclusion, I think people immediately when they think of diversity go right to, oh, we need to hire more X, Y, Z people. And I think that's a mistake. I think looking first at the culture and looking at who, like, what does inclusion look like? Like, where are the pain points there? Who's feeling like more included or less included? Um, I love the culture amp tool that I've used for an employee engagement survey because it, it enables you to cut the data and look at not just the overall score, but what does the majority group feel like? And what are the minority group sentiments like? Um, and the difference there and that those gaps, like that's the juicy bit for me. So like, why do you think, I mean, so I, I feel like the, I don't want to say lazy answer, but the easy answer is patriarchy and white supremacy. But why do you think, <laughs> the, <laughs> why do you think that we're still not being intersectional in our data analysis? I think it, it's more, it's a bit harder. It's not the first thing. Like when I said it, it took us, it took us about three months to really understand what our baseline was. To take an intersectional approach would have been harder. Um, it was definitely not the, on the list of next things that I was going to do at Mozilla. But yeah, I think some people will say, and I haven't done enough research into this, for companies that aren't very big, when you take an intersectional approach at the data, the numbers get really small really quickly. <laughs> so there, there could be something about statistical significance, but I think it's just harder. Like, it's more complex and more complicated. Yeah, that's definitely, like, with my my next role, that's something I really want to get into. Let's talk a little bit about your, like, your background with the, the librarian, the master's in, like, talk to me about that, that master's degree. And, like, you know, when you say you love data, like, how have you historically taken data and then, like, allowed it to inform programming with organizations that you've worked with? Yeah, so I was a librarian for 12 years before I changed careers and came into tech and into DNI professionally. I did the technical type of work in libraries. So when a lot of people hear I was a librarian, they'll be like, oh, I love books. And I'm like, eh, well, that wasn't my job. I was working on the computer systems behind the books or, and also doing the metadata work. Um, and the five years I worked before Mozilla, I ran an accessibility organization that format shifted print textbooks into digital formats for students with print disabilities. So pretty niche stuff. Yeah. Um, and I think in libraries, like resources are so limited. Um, so using data is really key to program design and evaluation to figure out like where you can make the biggest bang for your buck, um, how you could help users the most with the limited resources that you've got. One of the things I've noticed between libraries and tech, and libraries there's a lot more time, but there's no money. And in tech there's a lot more money and resources, but a lot less time. So it's, it's an interesting kind of equation to play with. So let's talk a little bit about like, you know, when you think about the future, what you would say organizations need to do and shift. Are there anything like big things that come to mind in terms of like how they can proactively engage and mitigate more situations where they're having to put out just, you know, PR statements? I'm just thinking like 2020, it's just, it feels like there's just been like a cumulative layer of stuff. So global pandemic started to spread, um, that impacted people's health and jobs. There's been a lot of layoffs this year. Racism has been exposed to some people in the U.S. who haven't seen it in the way that they are now. Black Lives Matter and 
people of color and black people are fighting for human rights and the right to exist and be. And then there's a whole bunch of forest fires happening on the West Coast right now. And there's all sorts of like, there's like daily fuckery from the US government and Trump. Like the news cycle this year has been exhausting. So I just think those feel like heavy blankets that have just been stacked on top of each other. I don't know, like people are exhausted. Oh, and then parents. I'm, I don't have kids, so this is a piece I often forget about, like, caregiving responsibilities. Like, you ping me on Twitter to say, I'm going to be a minute or two late because I'm just putting my daughter down. Like, that. Yeah. Um, people taking care of elders, pe- pe- people taking care of sick people. Like, it's a lot. So I think people are exhausted. But the piece, like, there's there feels like there's some kind of tectonic big shifts happening where conversations around equity and inclusion and diversity, like they're more central and they're more kind of part of these big fault lines that are making big systemic changes. So part of me, like, I see the two extremes. I'm like, we should like, there's an opportunity to push hard right now for some big changes, which I think we need to do. And knowing that on an individual level, some people are just beyond done and just, bone tired and they just can't so kind of holding the complexity of both of those truths at once like that's not a great corporate strategy but thinking this out loud for the first time I I see those two things that are very very far apart as both being true at the same time no I think that's true it's just it's it's just an interesting season in time Taro this has been a dope conversation um Look, before I let you go, you know, if you had to talk to executives and give them like the three things that you you think would be, you know, important for them to really absorb and and like reflect on in this time, like what would those things be? Ooh, three things to reflect, reflect on. One, I would encourage executives to do the personal work that they need to do, whether that's unpacking white supremacy, whether that's understanding like gender disparities or learning more about queer and trans folks, like whatever people's learning is, like to figure out what that is and make a plan. Block off time in your calendar to do that work um, so that it doesn't slip away at the end of the day and become something that you just, I'll get to it next week, I'll get to it next week. Like this is important work to do on a personal level. So prioritize it and make time. Um, You could even buddy up with, someone you trust and have an accountability buddy there or an accountability partner where you read through something and discuss it together or discuss some difficult workplace scenarios and like the stuff that you're unpacking on a personal level like but make time and prioritize and do that work two I think if there's not clear accountability goals in your organization I would ask your peers why not Um, I would partner with your DEI lead or your chief people officer to figure out what those goals should be and put make them as part of your regular goals framework. Again, kind of like point number one, there's a lot going on and things can like slip off the sides, but if you put them in a place where there is an accountability framework and they are important and someone is responsible for moving the needle and measuring things, they'll get done. So make sure that they get done. And third, If you don't know who the black and brown leaders are in your organization who are informally or formally leaders and doing this work, find out and reach out and ask ask for time on their calendar to understand the work that they're doing and to understand what their career goals are and listen so that you have a good understanding of what your black and brown leaders' priorities are and then be a sponsor and advocate for them when they're not in the room lift up their work and make sure that it's visible and valued in your organization. Those are my three things. Yo, fire. Thank you. Good job. <laughs> I was like, oh, <laughs> this has been a, such a pleasure. You're so easy to talk to and such an amazing host. Um, it's a real pleasure to step back and think about these things and talk about with them with someone. Thank you. No, thank you. Uh, y'all, look, you know what we're doing, right? I'm so thankful I was able to speak to Tara Robertson, um, who is a, a whole host of things um, as she exists as multiple things at the same time, which is just the beauty and complexity of uh, humanity itself. I'm going to highlight the fact that she's a, a leader, 
an executive, public speaker, an intellect, an overall dope person. Until next time, y'all. Peace. Listen, I want to thank y'all. I hope that this holiday season is treating you safe, that you're staying warm, and uh, that you take care of yourself. We'll catch you soon. You know what it is. We're creating content that centers and amplifies black and brown folks at work. We do this every single week. Make sure you give us five stars. If you're not, you're a hater, but I love you anyway. (laughs) All right. Peace. Living Corporate is a podcast by Living Corporate LLC. Our logo was designed by David Dawkins. Our theme music was produced by Ken Brown. Additional music production by Antoine Franklin for Musical Elevation. Post-production is handled by Jeremy Jackson. Got a topic suggestion? Email us at livingcorporatepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us online on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and living-corporate.com. Thanks for listening. Stay tuned.